Welcome to episode number 33 of History for Shut-Ins. Today, we are going to discuss the Battle of Gettysburg. We will look extra close at the battle for Little Round Top on day two and the important role of Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. So the Battle of Gettysburg, remember, Lee has hatched a plan to invade the North. His hope is that by invading the North, he will draw Union troops from the siege at Vicksburg, which is being led by Grant. That does not happen. Gettysburg takes place July 1st through July 3rd of 1863. It is the largest battle fought in the Western Hemisphere. After defeating Hooker at Chancellorsville, Lee decides to invade the North to further discourage the Union and possibly induce European recognition. Confederate morale is soaring after Fredericksburg the previous December and Chancellorsville and Harper's Ferry. While defeatist sentiment is growing in the North, Lee has an army of roughly 71,000. In preparation for the invasion, Lee reorganized his army into three corps under A.P. Hill, James Longstreet, and General Richard S. Ewell. General Ewell has replaced Stonewall Jackson, and we will talk about how badly the Confederates miss Jackson and the role that Ewell plays in the ultimate Confederate defeat. Confederate cavalry is being led by General Jeb Stuart. During the last week of June, 1863, Stuart made a bold, ill-advised sweep around Union forces, passing between them and Washington, D.C. On June 28th, when the Army of Northern Virginia was extended deep into Pennsylvania, Lee is out of touch with Stuart. Lee considered Stuart the eyes of the Army. He has no idea where Lee is, or pardon me, where Stuart is, and because of that, he has no idea where Union forces are. Lee receives a report that the Army of the Potomac was at Frederick, Maryland, under a new commander, General George Meade, who replaced Hooker. Lee took immediate steps to meet this unexpected threat. General Ewell, whose corps was preparing to carry the offensive across the Susquehanna River from positions at Carlisle and York, Pennsylvania, was ordered to move either to Cashtown or Gettysburg. Longstreet's corps at Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, and Hill's corps at Greenwood, both of which had been preparing to move north, were to march east to Cashtown. This concentration east of South Mountain would put Lee in an excellent strategic position to either defend or attack. Early on June 29th, Meade started north with General John Buford's two cavalry brigades scouting ahead of the army. While maneuvering to keep between Lee and the federal capital at Washington, D.C., Meade intended to make Lee turn and fight before he could cross the Susquehanna River. On June 30th, Buford's troopers drove back Confederate brigades from, or a Confederate brigade, from Hill's Corps that was approaching Gettysburg. Hill then authorized General Henry Heth to lead his division into Gettysburg the next day. Buford, meanwhile, had immediately recognized the strategic importance of Gettysburg as a crossroads and prepared to hold the town until reinforcements arrived. Remember, a common theme with Civil War battles is that they take place along rivers, close to railroad hubs. Gettysburg at the time was a major road hub. So roads and ways in and out almost like a, the wheel, the spokes of a wheel with Gettysburg in the center, all sorts of routes into Eastern PA, Northern PA, Western PA. So Gettysburg is vitally important. 
On July 1st, one of Buford's brigades, armed with newly issued Spencer repeating carbines, delayed Heth's division until General John F. Reynolds' 1st Corps began to arrive in Gettysburg at 11 a.m. A counterattack drove Heth's two leading brigades back with heavy losses on both sides. Reynolds was mortally wounded in the engagement. He would be the highest ranking officer to die at Gettysburg and one of the most senior commanders killed during the war. Of course, Stonewall Jackson is right there too. By 1 p.m. on July 1st, all three divisions of the 1st Corps were deployed along Seminary Ridge. Two divisions of General Oliver O. Howard's 11th Corps arrived to defend the northern approaches to Gettysburg. A third division of the 11th Corps was posted on Cemetery Hill. So there are various hills, high ground, if you will, at Gettysburg. You've got Seminary Ridge, Culp's Hill, Cemetery Hill, and then you also have Big and Little Round Top. Howard reaches the field at noon, turning his 11th Corps over to General Carl Schurz and succeeding General Abner Doubleday, yes, that Abner Doubleday, in command of the battlefield. The Union resisted on both fronts until about 2.30 in the afternoon, but Confederate, a Confederate attack by Jubal Early's division against the northeast flank of the 11th Corps led to basically the dissolving of the Union position, the weakening of it. The 11th Corps was routed, exposing the flank of the 1st Corps and forcing it to retreat. Before the defenders could rally on Cemetery Hill, the two Union Corps had sustained greater than 50% casualties. Lee now, for one of the rare times in the war, has superior strength. But because Jeb Stuart is still riding all over hell and creation, he is in the dark as to not only the Union strength, but where they're located. Lee does not want to bring on a general engagement until James Longstreet's Corps arrives. At about 4 p.m., General Winfield Scott Hancock arrived to examine the situation for Meade and decide whether to drop back to previously prepared positions along Pipe Creek, 15 miles southeast of Gettysburg. After recognizing the importance of Culp's Hill and ordering it to be occupied, Hancock studied the terrain and reported that Gettysburg was the place to fight. Having reached the same conclusion, Meade orders the 3rd Corps of General Daniel Sickles and the 12th Corps of General Henry Slocum to move forward. Lee told Ewell to attack Cemetery Hill if possible. Lee's words, but Yule does not. Remember again, Yule has replaced Stonewall Jackson. Stonewall Jackson would have attacked in a heartbeat. Yule says, hey, it's not possible, I'm not gonna do it. By the end of the first day of battle, the total casualties at Gettysburg were over 15,000. On day two, by dawn, Union troops occupied a, long, a line along Culp's Hill, Cemetery Hill, and Cemetery Ridge. Both opposing commanders recognized that Confederate success on the federal right would jeopardize Meade's position by threatening his line of communications along the Baltimore Pike. Lee wanted to exploit this weekend, this weakness but Ewell argued that Longstreet should make the main attack on the opposite flank. Longstreet said that Lee should make Lee, or pardon me, Lee should make Meade attack. So you have all sorts of disagreements. Go back to the Seven Days Battles when Lee first takes control and you have poor communication 
amongst the Confederate leaders because it's the first time they're working with Lee, talking about Longstreet and Jackson. Things got much better at Fredericksburg and even better beyond that at Chancellorsville because they knew each other. They, they knew each other's tendencies and trusted each other and those sorts of things. Now with Ewell in the mix replacing Jackson, you have great uncertainty. And it's almost like he is, you know, the, the wrench in the machine stopping it. So what happens? Delayed by the opposition of his core commanders, Lee does not issue his orders until 11 in the morning. Longstreet was to envelop the federal south flank and attack north along the Emmitsburg Pike, where Lee incorrectly believed Meade's main line to be. Again, he has no idea. Jeb Stewart still has not arrived at Gettysburg. Hill and Ewell were to make secondary attacks. When Longstreet's artillery started preparatory firing at three in the afternoon, Meade rushed to the neglected south flank and found that General Sickles had not positioned his third corps along Cemetery Ridge as directed, but actually moved them forward to higher ground. This created a dangerous salient and weakened the Union South flank, but it was too late to pull Sickles' troops back. General John Hood's division of Longstreet's Corps attacked the Union left at four in the afternoon. We're going to rewind a little bit and talk about Little Round Top. On the morning of July 2nd, Little Round Top held but a handful of Union soldiers. Pennsylvania native Brigadier General John W. Geary's division was just north of the hill and was the largest Union force in the immediate area. If you look at a map of Gettysburg, Little Round Top is on the extreme left flank of the army, okay? And it's high ground. Geary is ordered to rejoin the rest of his 12th Corps at Culp's Hill after elements of Sickles' 3rd Corps took his place. Because of confusion, Geary pulled his men out too soon before Sickles' men had moved to replace them. Little Round Top is left totally uncovered. Later, when Sickles' infantry did arrive, he moved his men without orders westward toward the Emmitsburg Road. What happens? Little Round Top once again has no Union protection whatsoever. Lee is hastily assembling a force to attack the Union left but it would take him the greater part of the day to get his men ready. Remember, we said Longstreet doesn't move until four in the afternoon. Meade sensed something significant about the two adjacent hills to his left. That afternoon, he sent his chief of engineers, Brigadier General Governor K. Warren, to assess the situation. Warren found Little Round Top completely undefended. He sent messengers to Meade and Sickles requesting immediate assistance. Sickles is completely engaged with elements of Longstreet's Corps, so he cannot send any assistance. But Colonel Strong Vincent, who commanded the 3rd Brigade of Brigadier General Charles Griffin's 1st Division of the 5th Corps, received word about the threat to Little Round Top and led his men to the hill at double quick pace. Vincent's brigade included the 44th New York, the 16th Michigan, the 83rd Pennsylvania, and the 358-man 20th Maine under Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain. The flag behind me, let me duck. That is the regimental flag of the 20th Maine. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain was a professor of modern languages at Bowdoin College. Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain is one of the most important people in American history that many people don't know of. 
while teaching at Bowdoin, the war starts. He goes to the president of the college and says, I would like to enlist and fight in the war. The president says no. He waits several months and he goes back to the president and says, of Bowdoin College and says, I'm going to take a sabbatical. President of the college says, go for it. What does Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain do? He enlists. June of 1862, Chamberlain offered his services to the Union. He was given command of the newly formed 20th Maine, a, union, a unit of extra men that actually were left over from other new regiments. The 20th Maine was not one of Maine's favorite fighting units. No county claimed it. No city gave it a flag, and there was no send-off when they went to fight. The 20th Maine had been organized under Lincoln's second call for troops on July 2nd, 1862. The regiment initially fielded 1,600 plus men, but by Gettysburg, the stress of campaigning thinned the ranks to less than 300 soldiers. The 20th was considered a weak link in Vincent's brigade. On May 23rd, 1863, 120 three-year enlistees from the 2nd Maine Infantry were marched under guard into the regimental area of the 20th Maine. The 2nd Maine men were in mutiny, angry because the bulk of their regiment, men who had two-year enlistments, had been discharged and sent home. The 2nd Maine Regiment was disbanded. Mutineers claimed they only enlisted to fight under the flag of the second main regiment if their flag went home was their reasoning so should they by law however the remaining men owed the army another year of service chamberlain had orders to shoot the mutineers if they refused duty fortunately for the men of the second main Chamberlain was born and grew up in the town of Brewer, Maine, which was the twin city to Bangor across the Penobscot River, where the Second Maine Regiment was recruited. Many of the mutineers in the Second Maine were childhood neighbors of Chamberlain's. Instead of shooting them, what he does very wisely is he distributes veterans of the Second Maine evenly to fill out the 20th Maine's ranks and integrate experienced 2nd Mainers with the untested 20th Mainers. As he arrived on Little Round Top, Colonel Vincent chose a line of defense that started on the west slope of the hill. Remember, again, Little Round Top is at the extreme left. It's the left, it's the end of the line, basically. It's on the left flank of the Union line, this massive Union army. So when the first regiments reached the rocky outcrops on Little Round Top, Vincent put them into line. The 16th Michigan took up a position on the right flank of their line. The 44th New York and 83rd Pennsylvania held the center with the 20th Maine taking up its position last curving its line back around to the east and forming the Union Army's extreme left flank. So you basically have the 20th Maine, a force of 368, if you will, on the extreme left flank of the massive Union Army. The last thing that Colonel Vincent tells Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain is that you are to hold this ground at all costs. Chamberlain deployed Company B, commanded by Captain Walter G. Morrill, forward to the regiment's left front flank as skirmishers. Company B, with 44 men, was subsequently cut off by a Confederate flanking attack, leaving the 20th with only about 315 armed men on the main regimental line. Helping to defend Little Round Top were Major Homer R. Staunton's second U.S. sharpshooters. Their skirmishing abilities 
were unequaled in the army, so they bring some good street cred to the battle. A 14-man squad was attached to Company B. The men took up a position in a ravine east of Little Round Top. Shortly after the Union take up their positions, 824 men of the 4th and 5th Texas regiments of Major General John B. Hood's division hammers up the slope of Little Round Top, pushing toward the center and right of Vincent's line. During that assault, Captain James H. Nichols, the commander of the 20th Maine's Company K, runs to alert Chamberlain that the Confederates seem to be extending their line toward the regiment's left, where the, for most part, untested 20th Maine is. Chamberlain called his commanders together and told them his battle plans. With this new information from Nichols, Chamberlain ordered a right angle formation, extending his line farther to the east. Meanwhile, Colonel Vincent tried to rally his 3rd Brigade as the 16th Michigan staggered under heavy assault by the 4th and 5th Texas Brigades. Just when the Union was on the verge of collapse, Colonel Patrick O'Rourke, good countryman there, led the 140th New York Zouaves into the gap to save Vincent's brigade. Vincent is killed. O'Rourke is killed. Elements of Hood's division, the 15th and 47th Alabama, began to smash into the main troops. Hood ordered these regiments, led by Colonel William C. Oates, to find the Union left, turn it, and capture Little Round Top. Oates said that he could take Little Round Top and with a few cannons, blow the Union Army to bits because that is the high ground. Colonel, or pardon me, Color Sergeant Andrew J. Tozier of the Second Maine emerges as an unlikely hero and is later awarded the Medal of Honor. Sixty-four Medals of Honor are awarded to those who fight at Gettysburg. The Color Sergeant was a dangerous but coveted position in Civil War regiments. They're the ones carrying the flag. It was seen as a great honor to carry the flag, and it is. However, in battle, I think I would rather have a gun. The color sergeant was generally manned by the bravest soldier in the unit. As the 20th Maine Center began to break and give ground in the face of the Alabama Regiment's onslaught, Tozier holds firm. Tozier's gallantry in defending the 20th Maine's covers became the rallying point for companies D, E, and F to retake the center. They all come to where the covers are. Were it not for Tozier, the 20th Maine would likely have been beaten at this point. With their ammunition running out, Chamberlain decides to fix bayonets and charge down into the two Alabama regiments. So the way that, that, remember, Chamberlain sets up on a right angle. So at the end of the line, he's got forces going this way, and then his right angle is facing as such. When they charge down the hill, this closes, pardon me as I'm trying to get my bearings here, this angle closes like a gate to sweep up the Alabamans. The men were led down the slope when the Confederates were 30 yards away. Another crisis faces the main soldiers when the left side of the regiment drew even with the right, short of where they had planned to meet. During the charge, a second enemy line of the 15th and 47th Alabamans tried to make a stand near a stone wall. For a moment, it looked as though the Confederacy might succeed. but Using the element of surprise, Captain Morrill's Company B rose up from behind a stone wall and fired a volley into the Confederate rear. According to Colonel Oates, it was the surprise fire of Company B that caused panic among his Confederate troops. 
so basically what happens here is little round top is saved thanks to the 20th main chamberlain and really others vincent and his troops but one very interesting point if you were to draw a line from where the 20th main called home to where the alabamans call, called home literally geographically in the center of that line is gettysburg you can't make it up so while governors while governor warren's action secured the main battle position the federal third corps was driven from sickles salient with heavy losses there was desperate fighting at little round top devil's den the wheat field and the peach orchard both hood and sickles were seriously wounded confederate secondary attacks were so poorly timed again missing jackson here stonewall that Meade could shift strength from quiet parts of his line to meet each new threat hill attacks too late ap hill attacks too late to achieve significant results not until 6 p.m did Yule launch the assault that should have begun hours earlier to coincide with Longstreet's? Again, Yule being the replacement for Jackson. So just time after time, Yule comes up short. Some of Yule's troops reached Cemetery Hill, but were driven off, while others were stopped on the southeast slopes of Culp's Hill. Casualties on the second day of battle were 20,000 by itself. The second day of Gettysburg was the 10th bloodiest battle of the war. So we move forward to day three, July 3rd. Despite Longstreet's objections, Lee is determined to attack on July 3rd. Lee, Meade was less confident. After a formal council of war, Meade decided to stay and fight. While Ewell made a secondary attack against Colts Hill, Lee planned to hit the Federal Center with 10 brigades, three of which were fresh troops of General George Pickett's division. Pickett's only overall responsibility during Pickett's charge was to form the divisions of Brigadier General James Johnston Pettigrew, who had assumed command of Heth's division after Heth was wounded on July 1st, and General Isaac Trimble, who had taken over General Dorsey Pender's division after Pender was killed on July 2nd. So, Pickett takes them over as they reach their attack positions on his left. Longstreet is in command of the operation and is trying to tell Lee, do not do this. However, Longstreet says after the war, when Lee got his blood up, you could not tell him otherwise. And he said, Lee's blood is up. Shortly after 1 p.m., the Confederates started a tremendous artillery bombardment, which was answered immediately by federal counterfire. At three in the afternoon, the Confederates moved out of the woods in parade ground order and started across the 1,400 yards of open fields towards Cemetery Ridge. So they're basically marching a mile. The Federals watched in awed silence as 15,000 Confederate troops were moving towards them. Union artillery, which had ceased fire for an hour previously to save ammunition, went back into action with devastating effect. So as these 15,000 Confederates are coming closer and closer, the Union artillerists are just taking out large sections with shot after shot after shot. Almost unscathed by Confederate art artillery, most of which had gone over their heads, 10,000 Federal infantry waited behind stone walls and held their fire until the Confederates were within range. The Southern spearhead of Pickett's charge broke through and penetrated onto Cemetery Ridge for a short period, but it could do no more. 
Critically weakened by artillery during the approach, formations were hopelessly tangled, lacking reinforcement, and under attack from three sides. This marks the high tide of the Confederacy, leaving 19 battle flags and hundreds of prisoners, the Confederates retreat. Part of one Union brigade advanced to hasten the Confederate retreat, but the Army of, Potom of the Potomac did not mount a counterattack. Lee rides out as Pickett's charge is retreating to try and rally the men and also to say, this is my fault. Later in the afternoon, Lee says to Pickett, General, reform your divisions. And Pickett says, General Lee, I no longer have a division. Pickett remains bitter towards Lee for the rest of his life, saying, and I'm paraphrasing a bit, that old man destroyed my army. Earlier in the day, on July 3rd, Ewell had attacked Culp's Hill without success. Stuart whose bone-tired brigades had arrived the previous evening, and Stuart caught an icy stare from Lee when he arrived, Stuart saying, General, I have, you know, 300 horses and wagons for you. And Lee says, they are nothing but an impediment to me now. I needed you to help me beat these people, and you were now nowhere to be found. And really admonishes Stuart. So, Stuart is driven back by three Federal Cavalry Brigades when he tried to envelop Meade's strategic north flank. At the other end of the lines, Federal Cavalry was employed in futile and costly charges across rough terrain against Hood's infantry. Lee and that's it, Gettysburg, the Union wins. It's a resounding victory. Lee waits during July 4th, thinking that Meade is going to attack him on Seminary Ridge, but Meade does not. Another great opportunity to, I don't want to say end the war, but really destroy Lee and his army, which would have brought about the end of the war much faster. The night of July 4th, taking advantage of heavy rain, Lee started retreating to Virginia through the South Mountain Passes. Lee was held up at Williamsport for a week, waiting for the Potomac River to subside. But on the evening of July 13th, he withdrew his army and trains into the Shenandoah Valley before Meade, who had appeared on his front the night before, the day before, could launch an attack. So Meade basically has, from July 4th, until July 13th to do something and does absolutely nothing. Lincoln loses his mind. And this starts to set the table for you know who to take over command of the Union Army in the East and then be the general in chief of all the armies. After the war, when Gettysburg was recognized as the, as the turning point, the Confederate sentiment was to charge Longstreet with losing the war by not cooperating with Lee on July 2nd and July 3rd. Longstreet, remember, was unenthusiastic about the invasion of Pennsylvania and advocated forcing the Union to attack. Confederate successes at First and Second Bull Run, Antietam, Fredericksburg, and even Chancellorsville convinced him that the war could be won adopting a tactical defensive posture while conducting strategic offensive operations. Lee's defeat came from overconfidence in his own troops. Rightfully so, they've been on a long winning streak or an impressive winning streak. Also, Ewell's inability to fill in for Jackson and bad reconnaissance because of Jeb Stewart. Lee, and here's where this is a problem for Lee. He is so dependent on Stuart personally that he never properly employed or failed to properly employ four cavalry brigades left at his disposal. Meade has been criticized, rightfully so, I think, for not destroying the Army of Northern Virginia by pursuing them. 
However, he does have to be given credit. He has control of the army for five days before Gettysburg happens. He wins Gettysburg and he stops the Confederate invasion of the North. Coming a day before Grant's triumph at Vicksburg, Meade's victory meant that Confederate destruction was a matter of time. Lee actually offered his resignation a couple of weeks later to Jefferson Davis, and he said, no, I cannot accept it, sorry. Losses at Gettysburg were among the war's heaviest. Of 94,000 Northern troops, there were 23,000 casualties. More than 3,100 were killed in action. Of 71,000 Confederates, 28,000 casualties, 3,900 killed in action. Dedication of the National Cemetery at the site in November 1863 is, of course, the occasion for Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. The battlefield becomes a national military park in 1895. Speaking of the Gettysburg Address, the main address at the dedication ceremony for the cemetery and battlefield was actually a two-hour speech by Edward Everett. He was the best-known orator of the time. Steeped in tradition of ancient Greek oratory, Everett's speech, about 13,000 words, were delivered without notes. The Gettysburg Address is 272 words. Very brief, and you would think it would hardly draw notice. After the speech, Lincoln says, or the address, Lincoln says, I don't think it will wash. You know, I don't think it will be remembered. Despite some criticism from his opposition, it was widely quoted and praised. On the day following the ceremony, Everett wrote to Lincoln, quote, I wish that I could flatter myself that I had come as near to the central idea of the occasion in two hours as you did in two minutes. There is a quick picture of Lincoln, blurry picture of Lincoln, sitting down after the address at Gettysburg. The thought was, after Everett had spoken two hours, that the cameraman would have plenty of time to get his equipment ready and the lighting right to take a picture of Lincoln. He hustled to get a picture of Lincoln walking away after the address to sit down. And we're going to end today on this, the address itself, which I'm sure many had to memorize when you were in school. I taught a class this past fall on Lincoln and slavery to a, a group of senior citizens. And I would say of the 30 in the class, two dozen of them knew the Gettysburg Address by heart. It's pretty cool to see. So here we go. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live. It is altogether fitting and proper that we should do this. But in a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, we cannot hallow this ground. The brave men, living and dead, who struggled here have consecrated it, far above our poor power to add or detract. The world will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what they did here. It is for us, the living, rather, to be dedicated here to the unfinished work which they who fought here have thus far so nobly advanced. 
It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion, that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom and that government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth. Thank you for joining today. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them here and I'll be happy to answer them. Also feel free to share information on History for Shut-Ins. Thanks for sharing your comments on my great self haircut. Appreciate that. We will be off tomorrow, Friday, we'll, but we will be back on Monday at 5 p.m. with episode 34 of History for Shut-Ins. Thank you so much. Have a good night.